Thank you. <laughs> That's the best kind of introduction. But, well, but we do now know what the students at the school, what things they say when they're going to somewhere down the Well, thank you for coming out for this uh, Atlantic Theological Conference uh, book study, a kind of new adventure. Uh, I hope that it'll work out all right. Uh, I've learned a little bit over the years of, of, of teaching uh, that when it comes to literature, there are things that people like and things that people don't like, authors that they like and don't like, and characters within books that they like and don't like. And I'm sure that's the case with uh, Louise Penny's um, uh, Armand Garmash uh, novels. I've already heard from some people how they're just absolutely in love with Louise Penny, and then other people just can't stand her. Um, but uh, my interest is uh, not so much about whether one likes or doesn't like uh, certain works of literature. It's more a question about what it is that they have to say. So my uh, title really is uh, related to the text. Uh, and it's simply this, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. And we'll, of course, discover where that comes from and something about what it means and its significance with respect to uh, this particular novel. So what I'd like to do uh, this afternoon is to offer some reflections on the conference theme by way of a brief consideration of Louise Penny's uh, novel, The Madness of Crowds, complemented by a sidelong glance at Edward Allan Poe's The Mask of the Red Death and John Donne's sonnet, What If This Present Were the World's Last Night? So what are we in for? Well, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. <laughs> Only I don't think we really do feel quite so fine. Now, The Madness of Crowds was published in 2021 as a post-pandemic novel in her popular series of now 17 Chief Inspector Armand Garmash's detective mystery stories. The title, The Madness of Crowds, is taken from Charles McKay's uh, Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, circa 1841, and went through various editions. And that work explores a great range of examples of what we might call the psychology of mass hysteria, which is explicitly referenced in the novel. It's actually a very long, rambling book. Uh, excerpts from it have been reduced to something very, very small because the only people who seem to be really interested in it uh, these days are people who uh, are, are in business and in finances and wanting to see how it is that they could persuade people to buy things. <laughs> now, Louise uh, Penny's novels uh, really uh, are part of detective mystery stories. And uh, in a way, she belongs to a whole array of detective mystery stories that explore uh, a great range of ethical questions and problems belonging to our contemporary world. So I just wanted to try and locate Louise Penny within a larger uh, genre of literature, detective mystery novels. Uh, and I wanna mention, first of all, someone like P.D. James, uh, uh, her Adam Gal Dalglish's chief detective commander of Scotland Yard detective mystery novels. Uh, and of course, couldn't avoid mentioning uh, her other work, which steps outside of those detective mystery novels, The Children of Men, which was written in 1992, but it's actually set in a kind of dystopian post-apocalyptic world of England in, get this, 2021. So we're just living in it right now. Uh, so that's one uh, novel we might want to associate things with. In fact, with respect to uh, P.D. James, I sometimes think that Armand Gamache uh, uh, has certain similarities to the figure of Adam Dalglish, uh, you know, a thoughtful soul with poetry in his soul, it seems to me. Uh, another uh, detective mystery novel uh, writer that I like to read a lot of is uh, Donna Leone, uh, her commiss Commissario Guido Brunetti detective mystery novels, over 20 of them now, uh, all of them set in Venice. And the latest one is Give Unto Others. Quite often the titles themselves are quite significant of some of the ethical uh, concerns and questions that uh, arise there. Uh, there's of course, Canadian English uh, writer, Peter Robinson, his inspector, Inspector Alan Banks, detective mystery novels, all set in the Yorkshire Dales of England. Uh, there is of course, Ian Rankins, uh, Inspector John Rebus, detective mystery novels, all set in Scotland, mostly Edinburgh, 
uh, and sometimes dubbed Tartan Noir, at least, <laughs> uh, at least as my uh, daughter Madeline uh, tells me, who's just recently also uh, introduced me to uh, a figure that influenced uh, John Rankin, uh, William McKilvany's Laidlaw trilogy set in Glasgow, very much Tartan Noir. There are others, but in one way or another, uh, the point here is that they all uh, feature on uh, certain kinds of complexities of human thought and action in the midst of the ethical confusions and concerns that are part of our world. And all of them, interestingly enough, have this strong association and connection to, to place. Now, ethical here uh, refers to the idea or concept of what is good and right to think and do. And that cannot be just for the few. It has to be for all. And that is, I think, very much at issue in Louise Penny's novel, The Madness of Crowds. Justice, as Plato shows us in the Republic, cannot simply be the interest of the stronger, that might equals right. The philosopher, he argues, must return to the cave of our confusions. His pursuit of wisdom is not a private matter. He's obliged to seek the good uh, of all. John Donne, begins his wonderful exploration of the paradoxes of relationship in the incredible sonnet entitled Annunciation as follows. Salvation to all that will is nigh, that all which always is all everywhere, which cannot sin and yet all sins must bear, which cannot die yet cannot choose but die. And this grounds the idea or concept of the good for all, meaning everybody who wills the good, which as Plato teaches is in fact everybody, however mistakenly, to ground everything in God, who is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent, in short, all in all. Now, Louise Penny's novels frequently reference certain theological ideas. In a number of her earlier works, Matthew 10, 36 serves as an anchoring theme. And of course, you all remember that because you've memorized the Bible. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. And this points to the issues of betrayal and corruption in the soul and in the social order, which her novels frequently and indeed consistently examine. So here in this novel, she takes instead Julian of Norwich's famous statement as the uniting thread for the novel. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. And this is the dominant theme of providence at work in the novel, in the midst of the confusions and complexities of human behavior and evil, in short, the different forms of our adversities. Yet the Julian theme is perverted and twisted precisely because it is used in the promotion of an agenda that is not for all, as Arman Gamash rightly notes. Ça va bien aller is the shorthand French version of Julian of Norwich's sentence. Julian, as Gamash notes, offered hope in a time of suffering. But unlike Julian of Norwich, Professor Robinson's brand had a dark core. When Robinson said, all is well, she did not in fact mean everything or anyone, everyone. Now the plague in the novel is not actually COVID-19, but the pandemic of fear that is its legacy and which leads to the ethical dilemma in the novel about how to deal with future outbreaks. Professor Abigail Robinson is a mathematician and a statistician writing and working at a Canadian university. And she has written a report on the social and economic consequences of the pandemic. It was actually commissioned by the Canadian government, but the Canadian government has then refused to allow it to be punished. 
she undertakes to make it public on her own through social media where it's gone viral and by means of a lecture. And this takes us back to Tom's paper at the very beginning of our conference about indeed the incredible power of the media. Perseverance in the novel is seen in the intent to uncover what is hidden, to get to the truth of things past and present. And this involves self-reflection and self-criticism, as well as an insight into the vagaries of motive and intention, a constant probing into what it means to be human and about the ethical obligations that belong to the, that belong to the forms of human knowing. There is no wisdom, no virtue in techne, in the technocratic world. Armand Gamache's four sentences that lead to wisdom as recalled by his son-in-law, Jean-Guy Beauvoir, are a critical part of the ethical reflection. Here's what they are. I'm sorry, I was wrong, I don't know, I need help. Those are things worth pondering for all of us, I think. The novel begins in media rays. Chief Inspector Armand Gamache has been tasked with protecting Professor Abigail Robinson at a public lecture taking place during Christmas week in a university gymnasium in L'Estrie, which is really a French neologism for the Eastern townships. It's a lecture which is going to be given before a crowd, Christmas week, of more than 500 people who are strongly divided in their emotions and opinions. As Louise Penny notes, they are tired of being afraid. There are two, of course, the seeds of anger sown. The lines of poetry attributed to the remarkable character of Ruth Zardo with her fuck duck uh, Clara in the novels. And I'm, I'm just saying what's there in the story. Um, uh, are actually from Margaret Atwood's poems, or as here, from Marilyn Plesner's poem, Beyond Repair. Who hurt you once so far beyond repair that you would greet each overture with curling lip? When were these seeds of anger sown and on what ground they should flourish so, watered by tears of rage or grief? It was not always so. There are those who see her proposal as the only way forward, as a merciful and practical solution on the one hand, and those who saw it as an outrage, a shameful violation of all they held sacred on the other hand. And there are the contemporary ethical concerns about freedom of speech in relation to public safety. Quebec was a society that felt things strongly and wasn't afraid to express them, which was a good thing. It meant that they were doing something right. The goal of any healthy society was to keep people safe, to express their unpopular views. But there was a limit to that expression, a line. And Armand Gamache knew he was standing on it, trying to find and defend that spot between freedom and safety. Even more, he's being asked to protect someone whose views he strongly disagrees with. The ethical and the personal are intertwined throughout the novel and in interesting ways. What drives him, what's the catalyst for his own character in the novel, is what happened in the nursing homes during the pandemic. Called to a nursing home, he discovered that the most vulnerable, the weak, the infirm, those who could not care for themselves had been abandoned, left to die, and die they had. And our man had been the first in and the last out, staying with each man and woman, each body, until all had been removed. And then sending teams <coughs> to other nursing homes until all the horrors were uncovered. 
He says that it was a shame he'd carry all his life. Not that he himself had abandoned these people, but that Quebec had, Quebecers had. And he, as a senior police officer, had released, realized sooner that this could happen in a pandemic, that this could ever happen here. And on another level, <coughs> personal level, his latest granddaughter, Idola, has Down's syndrome. All this adds to the dilemma of having to protect Abigail, Professor Abigail Robinson. Her solution is mandatory euthanasia of the elderly and the frail and the termination of all pregnancies with defects. That is how all will be well, at least, <coughs> excuse me, for some. <coughs> These are the two things which uh, contribute to uh, his situation and character. The solution, as she says, is mercy killing. But in our man's mind, it wasn't mercy killing she was proposing. It was, he knew, just killing. Even as he saves her when the firecrackers go off and gunshots are fired, the ambiguities <clears throat> and complexities of motive and intention are carefully explored, often in surprising ways. The shooter in this question, Edouard Tardif, thank you very so much, <clears throat> excuse me, deliberately undertook to miss, he was trying to shock her. But he turns out not to be some right-wing extremist gun-toting nut bar, but a woodsman committed to actually forest management. Yet he distinguishes between the culling of the trees of the forest and the culling of human life. There's a difference, he says, between a tree and a person. And what drives him and his family, his brother and his son, is that his mother had survived COVID in a nursing home, but wouldn't survive what Abigail Robinson is proposing, hence the seeds of anger sown, the seeds of division and animosity. The entanglement of the personal and the ethical are constantly in play. We actually discover much later on in the novel that Abigail Robinson has come to Lestrie at the invitation of those who actually want to try to convince her not to proceed with her project. Chancellor Colette Roberge points out to our man, it's really a lovely uh, part of the story, I think, uh, and one that's worth thinking a little bit about, points out to our man that mathematics is not linear, it's a curve. And in the brightest, most nimble of minds, it arcs around to meet philosophy, music, and art. It's a nice way of getting beyond the false divide between the arts and the sciences. And she references Bach. <coughs> now, this is not new to Gamache. He'd heard the same from another familiar character in the Louise Penny novels, the artist Clara Moreau at Three Pines. But does Abigail have this kind of understanding, this kind of ethical wisdom? Later, Colette admits to Armand that what Abigail is proposing is actually something wonderfully, she puts it this way, morally repugnant, but factually correct. A wonderful insight into the limits of the forms of our knowing. So I think Louise Penny is raising some critical questions about the ethics of what she calls throughout the novel, physician assisted suicide. Now actually in Canada now, we don't refer to it that way. It's been supplanted by another kind of euphemism, uh, medical assistance in dying made. But she's doing it, I think, in a very compassionate and thoughtful way, aware of the complexities of the situations that people confront, especially at the end of life times. But Abigail Robinson's position is really, I would suggest, a kind of scientism. The idea that science explains everything, it doesn't. It's actually a kind of religion, the religion of science, you might say, but without ethical wisdom. Knowledge as power without wisdom is destructive and deadly, and it can be twisted and perverted. The question I think throughout is who lives, who dies, who decides, and on what basis? 
The ethical dilemmas are coached explicitly, explicitly in terms of Christ's agony in Gethsemane. Let this cup pass from me. As Myrna Landers, another familiar figure in her novels, the psychologist who ends up in Three Pines observes. Now what she observes, I think, is very, very uh, interesting for us to ponder. She says, what Abigail Robinson is proposing isn't new. It isn't revolutionary. She says it's evolutionary. It's already happening. Quebec was the first province to legalize physician-assisted suicide. And our man says, yes, but with strict rules and oversight. That's a choice, he says. And so saying that, he's identifying the principle of autonomy and individual agency, which is used as the justification for ending a life. But Murnett responds, but pulling the plug isn't, at least not by the person about to die. It's a choice, she says, made by relatives. She goes on to say that it's a cruel position to be put in. Maybe we'd better off if that decision was taken out of our hands, off our conscience. And so our man says in response to her, are you saying you agree with her? She says, I'm saying it's not so clear cut. People have dug themselves into positions, but maybe we need to listen with a more open mind. And here she goes on to say something which I've, I've run into people's room. This has been the dilemma. She says, I've had to pull a plug. I'll never get over the trauma. Killing my own mother. That's what it felt like. I'd have liked that cup taken from me. But does deferring to the authority and actions of medical professionals in the state really remove that cup from us? And do we want to abdicate our ethical responsibilities and give it over to technocratic authorities. On the medical side of things, Gamash asked the police pathologist, Dr. Sharon Harris, how would doctors feel about mandatory euthanasia and terminating all pregnancies with defects? And her reply too, I think is quite interesting, especially in terms of the context of things in Canada. She replies that initially appalled is the word but then many were initially appalled with physician-assisted suicide. But once it became law, we got used to it. We could even see the virtue in it to ease suffering. It's the mandatory aspect that's troubling. She says it seems inconceivable that any government would allow what she's suggesting, to which he replies, we've seen a lot of the inconceivable lately. Now, to my mind, it is to the novel's credit that uh, it uh, is willing to address these kinds of questions, that she's even willing to raise such ethical questions and concerns and explore them. But what's really, I think, at stake in the story are questions about what's in our hearts. And so it's a line from, from, a line from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry's The Little Prince, and a line from uh, Fontaine's Fables that contribute to that question. So here's the line from The Little Prince. And now here is my secret, a very simple secret. It's only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. And then from Fontaine, by history we find it noted that lives have been just so devoted. Then let us all turn our eyes within and ferret out the hidden sin. It's these two lines that lead us into the dark heart of the novel. <clears throat> the murder of Debbie Schneider on New Year's Eve, a childhood friend of Abigail and now her secretary, results in the uncovering of the dark things of the, of the past. The ferreting out of, hidden sin, of the hidden sin is actually a line taken from one of the fables, Les Animaux Malades de la Peste, acted out by the children on New Year's Eve. And note, it is the animals sick of the plague, not with the plague. And what will be ferreted out will be the dark story of Ewan Cameron, which along with the remarkable character of Hania Daoud, served to challenge any kind of Canadian smugness and complacency 
about our inherent niceness. Now, this business about you and Cameron, I have to say, uh, uh, echoing uh, Dr. Curran, this is fact. This is not simply fiction. I mean, one of the interesting things about uh, these novels is that they really do relate, I think, to Timothy Findlay's great insight that sometimes fiction provides the clarity obscured by facts, uh, a wonderful kind of way of looking at things. Hania is a Sudanese woman who has survived the brutalities of rape and violence and is killed, not only to save herself, but others. She's committed to the children of the Sudan and is about to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. She's in Three Pines because the community has wanted to honor her. But along with Vincent Gilbert, a famous doctor and humanitarian with a guilty conscience, and now a recluse in the woods behind Three Pines, she too is a very difficult person. And together, they are viewed actually I rather love this phrase, as the two asshole saints. Kindness and cruelty reside side by side sometimes in the human heart. As our man says about Hania, she sees clearly what's wrong with the world, but not what's right in it. The last lines of Les Animaux Malades de la Peste are repeated several times and point to the moral dilemma. It's the world, really, of Thrasymachus. Thus, human courts acquit the strong and doom the weak as therefore wrong. Now Ewan Cameron, again, this is fact, was a psychiatrist of considerable note who was conducting experiments on his patients, working for the CIA, the Canadian government, doing such things as mind control, brainwashing, using LSD, sleep deprivation, electric shocks, et cetera, et cetera. illegal and unethical actions. MK Ultra was the name of the program used by the CIA in developing the psychological torture methods they still use today. Thus, we have to face the fact that Canada is complicit in the horrors of Guantanamo Bay. Vincent Gilbert, as a young intern, worked in the same facility and knew what was going on. He has tried to erase any traces of his work in the records of the Osler Library at McGill, but could do nothing about bills issued in his name for the medical treatments done by Ewan Cameron. Looking at his photo, the photo of Ewan Cameron, the librarian of the Osler says, the Prince of Darkness is a gentleman, quoting King Lear. We learn how the lives of two women were destroyed by these experiments. Enid Horton from Three Pines, whose papers contained the drawings of monkeys and Abigail Robinson's own mother who committed suicide. Both were broken souls ruined by Cameron. The monkey drawings by Enid, unearthed in her effects by Raina Marie, Armand Gamache's wife, belong to the trauma of sleep deprivation in which she heard constantly the screams of monkeys under torture. And of course it tortured her. Louise Penny connects the monkeys with the hundredth monkey effect, which derives from social anthropology and really relates to a question about the idea of a tipping point, namely when an idea explodes, people doing or believing the same thing. And this is, of course, an essential aspect of the madness of crowds. <clears throat> now, the key to the unraveling of the murder mystery about Debbie Schneider is the nickname used by Abigail's mother for her daughters and subsequently by Debbie for Abigail. It is Abby Maria, a play on Ave Maria and also on the word well, Ave Salve. This is yet another scriptural reference used in the novel. Abigail had a sister, Maria, who was severely disabled. The inquiry into the murder of Debbie Schneider leads to the ferreting out of Maria's death as murder and not something accidental. Abby Maria was her mother's way of connecting or uniting her two daughters. Abigail's father, another mathematician and statistician and friend of Colette Roberge, committed suicide after Maria's death and wrote a letter to Abigail and trusted the care of Colette while both of them were at Oxford. A photograph and the letter are critical to the resolution of the novel. Both are misinterpreted. It is the perseverance of Gamache, the intensity of his quest for the truth, 
which ferrets out the hidden sin and reveals the deeper motives of the heart. The letters seem to contradict what everyone said about Abigail's father. At first, it seemed to Gamash cruel and vindictive. I couldn't reconcile the two, he said. A loving father who kills one child and then burdens another with a lifetime of guilt? How could this be love? How could love, real love, ever be a reason to murder? At that point, Hania pipes up and says, I know how. And Gamash looked at her and nodded, yes, you do. You survived for love. And what you did, you did for love. And now I think I also understand. Now it is now, the dark thing is here, says Gilbert quietly, quoting Margaret Atwood's poem, Waiting. It's not dark yet, said Gamash, but it's getting there, quoting Bob Dylan. Now the letter from the father was misunderstood as a confession of his killing Maria and then himself out of remorse. Yet as Gamash says, the letter which seems so puzzling is really a letter of love. He was covering up the death of Maria, which he didn't commit by killing himself so as to protect Abigail all out of love. Because he knew that Abigail had killed his, her disabled sister. He knew you, says Gamash. Where he was selfless, you were selfish. Where he was sincere, you were manipulative. Where, you put your, where he put his family first, you put your ambition first. He loved you and wanted to protect you. Debbie Schneider had also come to know the truth of the letter, but wanted to see Maria's death really as a kind of mercy killing, and therefore to continue to support Abigail and her ambition. Her constant reference to Abigail as Abby Maria actually though threatens Abigail. It might lead to questions about the past, which paradoxically it does. Thus she kills her somewhat impulsively on New Year's Eve. Abigail, the story never fully confesses in the final standoff in the cabin in the woods, tries to get Jean Guy Beauvoir, Gamacha's son-in-law and the father of Idola to shoot her, thus making her a martyr for her cause. But he doesn't, and Abigail's arrested, though not for the murders, for without a confession, there are questions about material evidence. But there's the whole matter of the ideas that take hold of people, the madness of crowds. It's one thing to kill a person, but how do you kill an idea? Has Abigail's idea achieved the tipping point into the madness of crowds? Colette thinks that she's scared enough people into believing there won't be enough resources to recover from the pandemic. Never mind handle another. Unless the sick and elderly, she says, are allowed to die. And our man here says something quite interesting. He says, no, made to die by lethal injection. Capital punishment, he says, for men and women whose crime wasn't killing, but taking too long to die. <clears throat> now, that is a pretty strong uh, ethical statement, backed up in the novel with a commitment to act upon it. He has collected the mounting evidence against those responsible for abandoning the elderly, the frail, and care homes during the pandemic. He's meeting with the Premier of Quebec the next day to show him the files, to let him know quietly, confidentially, that if there's any move to adopt mandatory euthanasia or anything vaguely smelling of eugenics those files would go public. He was, he, it was, he knew, blackmail, but he and his conscience could live with that. In a way, the story forces us to look into the abyss, to face ourselves in the adversities that belong to human suffering. Where shall, we, where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Job's question, as we would have heard in the Canadian uh, lectionary last night at evening prayer. May you be a brave man in a brave country, is a line taken from Marilyn Robinson's uh, novel, Gilead. And it's carved on a bench at Three Pines. And underneath of it is another line, surprised by joy, taken from Wordsworth and then appropriated by uh, C.S. Lewis, of course. Um, 
these things are really all uh, about the struggle. Gamash, throughout the novel, has had to question himself precisely about bravery and about what actually is the best, such as the struggle, we might say. So I want you just to ponder this, uh, I think, quite powerful uh, passage about the struggle, the looking into the abyss. Terrible suffering when the end was inevitable, but taking too long. Plugs were pulled, respirators turned off, hands were held, prayers and promises and goodbyes whispered. But what happens when the suffering continued? Or when there were no plugs to pull? Just a loved one racked with uncontrollable pain and begging for help. What happened when nature was taking its time to take its course? when the necessary permission for assisted suicide hadn't been given in time. Was a nudge necessary? Did mercy sound like a soft footstep in the middle of the night? Did it look like a shrinch, a pillow? But was it always mercy? If looked at from a certain angle in a certain light, did the kind angel become wicked? Dispatching not a tormented one, but an inconvenience. Wasn't that the debate they were locked in now, thanks to Abigail Robinson and her campaign for mandatory euthanasia? Everyone was quick to say what happened was heartbreaking, but really, privately, they considered the tragedies of the pandemic a call of the week, a call of the week. The novel has the courage to wrestle with such things through a kind of ethical lens about what it means to be human. Christian language and images abound, to be sure, but the institutional churches are not in the picture, perhaps because they are caught between the scientism of technocratic culture on the one hand and the modern Gnostic ontology of identity politics in that culture on the other hand profoundly uncertain of the ethical wisdom of redemptive suffering, which the novel paradoxically and so powerfully portrays. Armand and Rene Marie are not particularly religious, we're told, though they both had a steadfast and private belief in God. Armand, entering St. Thomas's Church in Three Pines, crossed himself by habit even though this was not a Catholic church, it's actually Anglican. And he no longer considered himself, we're told, Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or Muslim. Yet certain ethical, spiritual, and theological ideas drive the argument, often through poetry. This is a lovely line. I think it comes from Marilyn Plesner. When my death us do part, then shall forgiven and forgiven meet again. Or will it be as always too late? Then shall forgiven and forgiving meet again. Or will it be as always too late? The last phrase of that poem was actually co-opted by Abigail Robinson and Debbie Schneider in the same way as Julian of Norwich's famous statement was used by them in their project. Forgiveness and love are the principles upon which the novel ends. The two asshole saints meet in the bistro. Vincent explains that he'd wanted to apologize to Abigail for what had happened to her mother, a movement of the heart towards reconciliation. Meanwhile, Hania is learning to think differently about adversity. She thought of the men that she'd killed as inhuman. But now she was beginning to realize a greater truth. Those men and boys had families, had motives, however flawed, had wounds of their own. They almost certainly had not been born with the desire to rape, to torture, to torment, and murder. They were monsters, but they were also human. And maybe, maybe in realizing the truth, she could finally find some measure of peace. Maybe that was the real prize. She suggests that Vincent try out his apology on her, which he does, a kind of substitution in love, we might say. 
and the novel ends. With Hania opening a card from her friends at Three Pines, which con uh, contains the words, ça va bien aller. She thought maybe it was true. That's rather wonderful. She thought maybe it was true. We end, in other words, with a deeper understanding, I hope, I think, of the providential words of Julian of Norwich. All shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of thing shall be well. A way to face adversity, but it takes courage, courage to persevere. I want to move at this moment, and I hope there'll be questions and comments because some of you will have all kinds of other interpretations and things to bring out, but uh, at your liberty, uh, I'll move on now to a brief consideration of um, the mask of the, of the Red Death. Is that all right? People, unless people have a burning question uh, to, to, to raise. So Edgar, Allan's poll, Edgar Allan Poe's The Mask of the Red Death, uh, 1842, a very powerful and compact short story uh, that complements what we've considered in the madness of crowds. And the, uh, what I'm going to do here is simply uh, set before you a brief synopsis of part of it by using just passages from it. It's very compact, uh, very arresting. I think it's really quite a remarkable work. So here's the story begins. It begins with the idea of the red death, the plague, uh, pestilence, very fatal, hideous. Blood was its avatar and seal, the redness and the horror of blood. It's really laying it on. Uh, the prince, his name is Prospero, probably an allusion to the tempest, happy and dauntless, sagacious. Uh, when his uh, dom dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court, and then we retire into the wilderness to, the cast to a castellated abbey. Extensive and magnificent structure. And here's the point. There was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the red death. And then we're told, uh, time goes past, the pestilence raging furiously outside, that, but inside the castle, the prince entertains his friends with a great masquerade. And where you get a very wonderful description of seven rooms, we're progressively going through one room to another room to another room to another room, until we finally get to the seventh apartment, which is described in, in particular detail. Closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries. Uh, the uh, color of the windows, though, is different from the tapestries, and it's the panes, of, the panes are in the color of scarlet, a deep blood color. And then we're told, this is important for the whole story, about, the, about a, a clock with a pendulum and so forth. And of course, the clock rings at every hour and the sound of the clock has always a kind of catches people, arrests them for a moment, makes them suddenly think and so forth. This will play an important part. Everybody is moved by the chimes of the, clerk, of the clock to a moment, the beginnings of a moment of a kind of reflection or worry or fear. Confused, medery, uh, confused meditation. <clears throat> and then we have uh, this, this mask um, at the, uh, but the figure itself appears. Uh, he was Oat Herited Herod. Uh, seems to have violated the uh, principles of propriety and so forth. Uh, and um, everybody is actually going to turn to be quite upset about this figure that appears at the mask. Of course, the, what the figure that appears at the mask is the mask of red death itself. So you get uh, a description of it, pretty, uh, pretty direct. Assuming the type of the Red Death, his vesture was dabbled in blood, his broad, broad brow and all the features of his face was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. So what happens? Well, at the 12th hour, 12th hour, music ceased. Uh, and, uh, and then suddenly people pay attention to this figure in their midst. And what we have is a breaking out of terror, horror, and disgust. Send not to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Prince Prospero, maddening with rage, uh, runs to the chambers, takes out Diagor and approaches the, uh, the figure and uh, gets uh, just within um, uh, you know, a, a few, few feet of him. 
three or four feet, uh, not exactly observing social distancing enough, I guess, uh, and uh, immediately drops dead. Dagger falls from his hands and so forth. Uh, and so then now was acknowledged the, the presence of the Red Death. He'd come like a thief in the night. One by one, all the revelers who were with Prince Prospero all dropped dead and Red Death had illimitable dominion over all. What is good, again, cannot be the few at the expense of the many. He tempted the prince to run off with a thousand people, leaving the rest of the population uh, to die. We are all implicated in the confusions of our world and day in some sense or another. There's no escaping uh, what confronts us all. No escape for the elites into their hedonistic pursuits from what befalls us all. No man is an island, as John Donne puts it. Each man diminishes me for I am involved in mankind. Therefore send not to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And from there now I want to go back further to John Donne's uh, remarkable sonnet. Uh, John Donne, 1572 to 1631. The sonnet was first published in around 1633. Uh, the sonnet, what if this present were the world's last night, offers a profound meditation and how we face uh, the um, end of the world, whether in the sense of our own deaths or something more cosmic and apocalyptic. So here's the octet, uh, John Donne's religious poetry, uh, in fact, uh, most of his sonnets all use the um, Petrarchan sonnet form, octet, sestet, rather than the Shakespearean English form of the sonnet where you have three uh, quatrains and a couplet, concluding couplet. Here we have the octet. What if this present were the world's last night? The inward, uh, is the question really is, is, is gonna move us inward, uh, but it's an interesting question. Uh, what if now were the last day, the last time, whether it's speaking about you individually or speaking about things uh, cosmically or culturally. And the directive is to mark, take note in my heart, O soul, where thou dost dwell. Take note of what? The picture of Christ crucified. So it's an inward looking attention is on the remembering of the image of Christ crucified. And the opening question of the sonnet is then answered by a twofold rhetorical question. Can what you see as remembered on the face or countenance of Christ frighten you? Can what you hear as remembered in the first words of the crucified on the cross judge or condemn you? Now, this goes back to uh, Peter Bryson's presentation the other night about different ways in which uh, Christ is represented to us. <laughs> and in terms of the doctrine of atonement, I think it's interesting to think about how uh, some of the earlier forms of the crucifixion have to do with the Christus Rex, Christ the King, where Christ is depicted as victorious over death, as reigning as a king, robed in, in royal uh, uh, garments and so forth. And emphasis upon the victory over sin and death. And then there's a shift uh, <coughs> starting in the early Middle Ages and reaching its apex in the 12th and 13th century of an emphasis upon the humanity of Christ, upon the sufferings of Christ. And so you have the figure of the crucifixion with Christ, uh, you know, half naked uh, on the cross in, in, in various postures and poses. Okay. Uh, the, uh, so I think that's interesting. So it'd be the first one, right, you know, the idea of Christ, the victor over sin and death. The other one about the uh, uh, substitutionary atonement, uh, Christ suffering for our sins. And then the other aspect, the atonement, of course, is the uh, moral aspect brought out by Abelard in terms of Christ being an example for us. Here, I think John Donne has in mind, don't know for sure, but I think he has in mind uh, depictions of the crucifixion that actually show Christ with the marks of the plaque. And I don't know which one in particular, but I think, I think would, this would be something which is perhaps what he has in mind, um, uh, something like this. But first of all, we get this, the two questions that respond to the opening question, what you see and then what you hear about the crucifixion and asking you, how, what does that mean for you? Okay. And then uh, we're, at, we're being asked to look within 
and to call to mind the images of the crucifixion, but images that emphasize Christ's suffering humanity, his suffering for us in suffering such things as the plague. So we might have in mind something like uh, this uh, particular uh, image. It's the uh, famous Eisenheim altarpiece by Nicholas of Hagenau and Matthias Grunwald, um, which shows Christ bearing the marks of the plague. So there's the, the big picture. And the uh, altarpiece was originally uh, placed in uh, the monastery of St. Anthony. Uh, it was done between 1512 and 1516. Uh, but actually the monastery served as a hospice for victims of leprosy and the plague who were cared for by the monks and nuns. So it's a little bit later than the actual Black Death, but the Black Death kept on recurring uh, over and over again, uh, as you know. Uh, and so here's a, a, a detailed picture. So I'm suggesting that perhaps what John Dunn has in mind is an image like that, something quite graphic, something which uh, shows the sufferings of Christ, puts it in your face as it were, and he's uh, thinking about that, interrogating that image and asking us to interrogate that image as remembered by us. So the sonnet then concludes with a sestet. So the octet had those opening question, what is present of the world's last night? To which we respond with two rhetorical questions. Mark in my heart, O soul, with thou dost dwell, the picture of Christ crucified and tell all the truth. What does that mean? Our pursuit of profane mistresses. The word is interesting. It means all and everything profanum, meaning outside the temple. All the things we worship in place of God, hence idolatry. What follows is an ellipsis, meaning the insertion of certain words needed to make sense of it. So what words are we talking about? Beauty of pity, foulness only is a sign of rigor. And when students look at that, they say, what? What does that mean? Well, it means that beauty is a sign of pity, a sign of mercy, just as foulness is a sign of rigor in the sense of death and decay as in rigor mortis. The conceit or idea here is that the beautiful woman always has pity or mercy on the lover. What should frighten us is our attachment to wickedness, thus to wicked spirits or horrid shapes assigned. But the image of Christ crucified, so gruesome and, and, and scary almost, even in the hideous form of the plague, is actually something beautiful and merciful. This beauteous form assures a piteous mind, a mind that is aware of its need for mercy. Really, really, I think, uh, quite, quite wonderful. And so, in a way, going back to Myrna Lander's comments about the, the trauma of pulling the plug, which in a way is like what I think uh, Professor Robertson was talking about, <clears throat> uh, about the light of nature, where we discover actually how in the light of nature there's a, there are divisions and tensions, and she's discovering those kinds of tensions. But here, in a certain way, what the sonnet does is to awaken us to uh, the grace, to seeing things in another way, to seeing what's, uh, how what's uh, essential is invisible to the eye. What is essential is invisible to the eye. And so it's really uh, about looking to Christ in his redemptive sufferings for us, and the world on the cross. And that requires perseverance in our loving attention to him in his word and sacraments, even, perhaps especially, in the midst of adversity. And that's really only possible out of a powerful sense of God's providence. For only so can all be well. All manner of things shall be well. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. Thank you. So let's intend to talk about the Eternity uh, novel and then to uh, illustrate a little bit by some things from uh, Poe and, and John Donne, but perhaps some of you have uh, comments, questions.
exocet missiles, uh, <coughs> or whatever. I'm all feeling uh, email. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Do you think um, the Louise Penny thing was that? Uh, well, I, I, th I think what's uh, I think she's moved by a, uh, a, a sense of ethical wisdom, but she's you know very carefully uh, she's very clear that she's not wanting to uh, connect that specifically uh, to that, and yet the religion, the Christian images run through the whole thing time and time again, and that's not just in this novel, but. Uh, Certainly, in this novel, those things are, uh, you know, are, are, are there. There's a, a separation, though, between that and the, and the church. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I wonder you know, if they were operating almost aesthetically. I, I, it's a curious, it's a very curious novel because it's almost as if it keeps leaping ahead of itself, almost, or something. And, and I wondered if they were being used. I just, it's a real question for me. I don't yeah. know. Are they well, no, used I, aesthetically yeah. or? I don't know if you, if you uh, the categories of criticism with respect to these novels, I think, you know, are themselves uh, uh, complicated. Yeah. What categories to use. And what I've seen already in her novels, and I haven't read all of them. Um, uh, Neil's read all of them except for this one, so he can comment. <laughs> yeah, he ruined it for me. But I've noticed a change in her novels, and, and, and I've seen this with other novels increasingly. They, 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 they come down to much shorter little chapters, I think chopped up, mm -hmm. and instead of uh, proper sentences, you get a whole lot of sentence fragments. Yeah. I think this reflects very much the influence of the, uh, the digital culture on, 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 on popular literature in a certain way, and so it moves along. This novel, uh, you know, uh, in some, at certain points, I think she's trying to throw too many things in. Yes. You know, you know, and, and, and sometimes it got a little bit, a little bit confusing. The ending is, is kind of uh, interesting, Neil, so I mean, I haven't completely spoiled it for you because actually it's a, a really... Uh, You're going to do now. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just how draw, how, in some ways how drawn out it is and exploring different motives and how Gamash gets it wrong and then realizes that he made a mistake in order to get it right. And I think that degree of self-analysis and so forth is actually one of the more interesting features, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of the story. Now she hasn't gone as far in terms of throwing in everything as J.K. Rowling's did in her last, uh, you know, Robert <laughs> Gilbreth uh, novel, which is about this thick, in which you know tries to just throw everything imaginable uh, into the into the story. But these things all seem to have a certain kind of uh, character to them now that, um, from a literary standpoint, I think is you know, not necessarily good altogether. I, I, I think one thing. one of her big throwaways is. Correct is not right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she repeats it, but never really develops it at all. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of things don't get developed, but you, you get a sense, though, that she's she's got a position. Yes. You know, I mean, she's actually saying some pretty strong things, uh, of, you know, about uh, what what she calls physician-assisted suicide. Um, you know, uh, uh, I found that you know quite 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 remarkable. To the, to the flies in the face of, of, of some of the tendencies within the, within the contemporary culture right now. So I thought that was uh, uh, interesting. And she, and she, I mean, she shows you, the, it allows you to feel the dilemma. And I think to my mind that's a good thing that novels can do. They can help you to feel the, the, the kind of dilemmas that people face in these ethical situations. And here's a, a novel which is dealing with, uh, with this uh, partly connected to, 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 to plague and partly connected to other uh, uh, issues that we're facing right now in the church. Yeah. Well, just, and just while I have four, there, there are two images that really popped out to me, Father Curry, mm -hmm. during your presentation. One is, you know, uh, Gamash is being so haunted uh, yeah. by what he saw in the nursing homes and how that, that is a thread that is a you know, long running stitch through the whole novel. Um, it, it made me think very much of listening to uh, some of the memories of liberators of, of camps like Dachau. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and <coughs> how, you know, 
the images that they saw, they feel are beyond verbalization, and yet that they have been, you know, that thread that has continually run through the rest of their lives and their experience. But also when you, the, the, uh, the image of the altarpiece and uh, the close-up, the details showing the marks of the plague, I can't remember what the term that they used for it, but Maria, the, this Abigail's sister who yeah. is, uh, has Down syndrome, uh, the, uh, the coroner, you say it? Pedicoyu. So, so this rash, like, uh, yeah. blood, uh, where blood vessels are burst because somebody has been smothered. And, and that image just made me think, you have Maria, who is the death mm. of the innocent. Mm. That you would, you know, yeah. the, you want to look for a Christ figure in here, perhaps mm. it's Maria, because she too bore the image of the plague. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, I don't know whether, Louise Penny doesn't seem to really build up on that kind of connection, but I think you're right to see that. I think that's that's legit. I think that's you know that's that's one of the first comment. You know, the there are references to things like the Second World War. We do get some background story about Armand Gamache's own father, Henri, who was a uh, a war resistor and yet went to the war, Second World War, as a medic, but was shocked to discover what you know the, the camps, and uh, ended up. Uh, bringing back to Canada uh, two refugees, which became uh, Armand Gamache's uh, godparents. Uh, so that's I, I, an interesting I, story. Sorry, so I was yeah. going to say, also with Maria, though, you have an intentional killing, even if it's disguised as a mercy killing. Yeah. yeah. It is even worse, it's disguised as a natural death. You know, by virtue of the peanut butter sandwich. Yeah, her, her, her father tries to, to cover it up by, by uh, in, in, in indicating that she choked on a and peanut butter like sandwich, which, which, which when you, you know, and it was, this is, we're looking back now along quite a number of years. It was hidden in the, in the mists of time, but then the hidden things are ferreted out. And that, that whole idea of things coming to light. Uh, but it's like, it's like the pulling of the pump. Uh, yeah. it, it, looks, yeah. it looks natural. Yeah. Yeah, no, good points. I like those. Those are wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I know writers hate to be asked questions when they're interviewed about how autobiographical is it, but I, and I've probably heard her interview. Uh -huh. She will not let somebody talk to you before I read the book or before she read it to me, I should say. Um, <laughs> and uh, much faster readers mean better. Uh, but um, I know her husband died. I can't remember the timing of that with the writing of the, of the novel. Just before, before, uh, before. I mean, she's written and two he, novels before. Uh, 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 this is either the second. This is the second novel, I think, after the death of her and husband. He, he had dementia, I think, as well. Yes. And, and yeah. I, I think, yeah. uh, as does Colette Roberge's husband right. in in the novel yeah. as well. Yeah, right. uh, Jean Paul. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I think she's saying something about physician-assisted suicide as well. But even how she lived her life, I think, because, like I said, I don't think she's going to say she's a Christian or anything, but she's certainly not waving the flag for that cause. So. Yeah. But to go back to Alan's point, I mean, I don't think uh, that, I'm not trying to say that this is what Louise Penny would subscribe to, but I think she's profoundly influenced by, by, that, by, that, by that Christian story, but also seeing it as something which connects to the fundamental ethical uh, principles that underlie other traditions as well. Uh, but the way in which she puts it is to avoid any kind of direct association with the church. Though St. Thomas's church does figure in every one of the Three Pines uh, novels uh, as clearly a place of sanctuary and often reflection and discovery. I think that's fair to say. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it, 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 it's certainly interesting that way. Yeah. Well, it's where, where the truth of Enoch, uh, I can't remember her last name, torture came out to. Yes, yeah, it was Ruth Zard on you that, that what Ian Fortin had gone through to some extent, and we find another monkey carved in the, in the, in the pews. <laughs> yeah, there, there, yeah, yeah. Neil. Thank you. This is, you know, wonderful uh, discussion and uh, so helpful. Um, so it seems to me that uh, your the novel is reflecting on this way in which our modern social order seems to put us in the place of God. Yeah. That is to say that it's up to us to order things providentially so that things will be well. For some. 
Uh, well, yeah. yeah. Um, and it seems that the guard, the danger with that is the precisely the utilitarian calculation that makes others instrumental to the well-being of, let's say. Yeah, or to put it another way, it's a kind of technocratic approach. Yeah. I mean, in and a way, Van der Gale is a kind of technocrat. You know, here's the facts. Yeah. And then it seems that Gamache is distinguished from that by saying, well, you have to have consent. He's, uh, in, the, in terms of that one scene there, you know, it's as if uh, the, the idea that there's a choice, consent right. somehow uh, is enough. But well, I the think the rest, the opposition is that consent is the place in which we are, as a society, given permission to, in that, you know, allow yeah. the general good to occur through the eradication of the particular individual. Right. And this just seems to me to be what is so problematic and fundamental almost every 